Hello and welcome to the eOrganic webinar on amending soils in the organic dairy pasture with Dr. Cindy Daly. My name is Deb Haliba and I work at the University of Vermont Extension as eOrganic's dairy team coordinator. eOrganic is the organic agriculture community of practice with eExtension and you can find all of our published articles, videos, and upcoming and recorded webinars at eExtension.org slash organic underscore production. Um, Cindy Daly is a professor in the College of Agriculture at the California State University at Chico. She received her Bachelor of Science degree in Animal Science at the University of Illinois and her PhD in Animal Science at the University of California at Davis. Cindy is the faculty supervisor and manager of the or Organic Dairy Teaching and Applied Research Unit at Chico State where in 2007 she spearheaded the effort to transition the dairy to a certified organic operation. The farm has 100 certified organic acres including 50 acres of irrigated pasture. Well thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to um, to uh, talk about the, the work that we're doing out here in California. We're doing some um, interesting work on trying to improve forage quality and we're doing that by basically addressing some of the issues with, uh, with soil and soil fertility because we've had our issues um, in terms of uh, the, the, the uh, area, the acreage that we have currently certified and that we're using for our organic dairy unit <clears throat> had some issues and so we embarked upon um, a research pro project basically to establish what the economic return would be for really addressing the uh, soil deficiencies. And certainly uh, the lush green forages you know, does in fact require a nice balanced mineral profile uh, and an optimal pH. So you know there's there's pasture and then then there's pasture and I, and I know you know what I'm talking about in terms of uh, overall um, pasture quality and, and productivity. So pasture is really fundamentally built upon uh, a soil matrix and it's a combination of, of mineral particles that you know basically make up about 45 percent of that profile. Um, Five percent of the uh, profile is organic matter which is the living and the non-living type biology, uh, most of which is dead organic matter which is being fed upon by muted organic matter. The rest is airspace and, and water uh, to move oxygen and, to that living biology beneath the soil. And the water, of course, is there to hydrate and to uh, you know, form these colloids and um, mat matrices of, of nutrients that um, move through that profile to uh, feed the plants and to, to feed the soil biology that's there. So I have a little bit of a delay, so you'll have to bear with me. Okay, the soil matrix itself is broken down into the physical, the chemical, and the biological attributes. The physical aspects of the profile include that crumb, the crumb structure of the aggregates, which really depend a great deal on the soil condition and uh, the particle composition. Um, and it, essentially, uh, much of that relates back to the ratios of the sand, silt, and clay components. Uh, the larger the aggregates uh, within the soil, the better for the most part because it really does open up that soil profile and allows for water infiltration and for oxygen to move um, into that soil. Um, a tight soil would be considered uh, a poorly structured soil and would have uh, very few um, air spaces for water and, and oxygen movement um, back and forth. The, bio the biology attributes of the soil uh, consists of really the living organisms which um, you know, feed on the fresh residues and the well um, decomposed residues and they're described as the living. And then you have the dead and the very dead. So th the living is a wide variety of bacteria and viruses, fungi, protozoa and algae. And it includes root tips and insects um, and earthworms and even larger animals like, like moles and so on. So the, the living portion represents about 15% of the organic matter and then the living feed on these plant residues in the manures and uh, the well decomposed organic matter um, we call humus and that's considered to be the very dead and it's uh, very stable um, in its very dead state and it does, uh, it holds on to nutrients and, and basically slowly releases those nutrients over time um, and it's there also to help 
improve water retention. So the more humus in the soil, the, the more water retaining capabilities that are, are, are there. And we want a really rich um, uh, biology. And the more complex and rich the biology, the more benefits that come back to you know, the, the crop and the livestock that um, are, 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 are feeding upon that soil profile. So the more complex the biology, the more nutrient cycling we have through that system, the, the more nutrient retention we're able to hold on to those nutrients, less nutrients are being lost. And it improves the structure and the infiltration of water and the water holding capacity. And we actually have some disease suppression taking place because we can now compete because we have so many beneficials um, there in that, uh, in that profile. So biodiversity um, beneath the soil is, is really an important um, component that we really need to strive for in our soils. Um, the chemical aspects of, of the, the soil attribute is really made up of the mineral profile um, and the nutrition. And these are basically you know, there and available um, in the, the soil depending upon the soil pH and the ratio of, of these minerals to one another. So they really do have a big impact on, on each other. They tend to have um, a lot of interaction. So we need to have them balanced in such a way that they um, um, interact um, and are able to be available to plants in, in a way that uh, the plant it needs them. And it does get a little complicated because if you look at the next diagram, it basically shows this wide variety of interaction that takes place between all these minerals um, in this system. So having the balance, the right ratio, is really important uh, to plant physiology. Um, we're also going to get into and talk a little bit about the, you know, the CEC or the cation exchange capacity of the soil because uh, um, much of the, the results are dependent upon the CEC in our soil. And the CEC is a measure of its ability to hold and release nutrients. Um, higher CEC soils. Um, tend to have more clay and more organic matter and uh, you know basically that's more shelving in the soil that um, these nutrients and um, minerals can can hang on to. So the more shelving the greater the capacity to hold on to these cations. And, uh, and basically you know if you do have a high CEC soil and your mineral balance is off it's going to take a lot more to correct that because you have you know a lot more um, miles to go. You have a lot more um, um, minerals to, to try and, and offset and to change the ratio of. Um, overall, for a good nutritious crop, if what we were really looking for in a soil uh, to, to grow the best forages would, would be this kind of a base saturation and the base saturation would be you know, basically the, uh, the, the ratio or the proportion of the mineral profile. Um, in that uh, soil. 75% of the base saturation in calcium, 15% in magnesium, 3.5% uh, potassium, 1% sodium. Uh, the percent of the CEC that a particular cation occupies is known as its base saturation. Um, and this was a system that was you know, basically brought about um, with, with Dr. Albrecht. And so all of that is really going to play a big role in this biological system that we have of, of or an organic pasture-based dairy system. Um, the more balanced the soil, um, the more balanced um, the grasses and the forages that are going um, into the cow. So it's a really important fundamental. So high quality forages, in order to be classified or qualify as such, you know, we're, we're looking at a, a forage analysis that would look something like this. Now some of these parameters uh, we'll try and define for you as we kind of move through this presentation. But overall we'd be looking at ADF and NDF and you know, these are measures of you know, the fiber component within, within a forage. Um, NDFD is going to be uh, essentially just how digestible this fiber component is. How, how available is it, um, its ability to be broken down and utilized as nutrients. Um, NEL is the net energy, so it's the, uh, the amount of energy in that forage. And then we've got a few measures of overall uh, forage quality. And um, uh, so we've got the relative uh, forage quality as an index of a variety of different parameters. And then we've got a mineral profile that we try to shoot for. And obviously, if these minerals are not in the soil, they're not going to be in the forages. 
So how do you know where you are? Well, you really have to measure. And, and I, this is basically one snapshot of a forage analysis that we had taken of, of uh, some silage a while back. And it, tell, it just shows you just all of the data that you can collect um, by, by testing your forage so that you know where you are on some of these real basic parameters. And when we began our dairy, we uh, essentially uh, did went out and did some soil testing. So we, we wanted to know where our baseline was and what, what kind of a program would we, we need to do in order to make some highly mineralized uh, forages. And so this is an example of the baseline that we began with when we started back in 2007. Um, with our program. You can see our pH is not too bad, um, you know, at a 6.6, .6, that's not bad. Our CEC was a 13.8. Again, not uh, too tough, but when you get down into the base saturations of the mineral profile, we were off um, quite a bit. Our calcium levels were significantly low at 55. Our magnesium levels were tend to be very high at, uh, at 33. And we had some micronutrient problems and deficiencies that we needed to address. Um, that you know, clearly sulfur and boron um, were were two that we were um, concerned about. So, in summary, the deficiencies we were you know terribly low in, in nitrogen. We had a low base saturation for calcium, and we had some deficiencies in sulfur and boron and zinc, and excesses in um, magnesium. And it's uh, and pretty well known that the calcium magnesium ratio determines uh, to some extent how tight that soil will be and we have some very tight soil and we've been battling that um, ongoing since 2007. Uh, so soil the soil pentrometer device would would have readings over 300 um, pounds of pressure so that's a little bit um, tight uh, and it's owing to the fact that we've got a very high magnesium and low mag uh, calcium level. So you can see we've got uh, we've got some places to go here. We've got uh, some room for improvement before we can really make these highly mineralized um, pasture forages. And calcium, you probably know, is uh, a very important nutrient. So to be deficient in calcium um, is going to be it's going to be very difficult to make those high that high quality forage. Calcium is a facilitator of, of all those nutrients moving in and out of the plant. Uh, soil calcium does impact the soil structure, as I've already said about you know the interaction between it and magnesium are really key. But it, it plays a role in breaking up clays and um, forming these aggregates to improve water movement. Um, calcium is also instrumental in terms of developing sugars within you know the um, the interior of the uh, plant cell wall. So in the cyto in the cytosol, we've got uh, pectins and a variety of other you know soluble carbohydrates, and calcium is really critical in the formation of those. And certainly, any calcium deficiencies are going to impact plant growth. So um, you know we're going to have smaller root masses and so on. So we're going to have to do some work to balance the soil there. Uh, boron is another important. Uh, um, component. It's an anion, so you know it tends to leach, especially in low CEC soils. You're going to end up losing some boron, so applications would have to happen every year if you're low in boron until you can build up your soil profile. So um, boron, really important for calcium absorption, so the two kind of work in tandem. So um, we're in a lot of trouble actually since you know no we're low on calcium and boron. And it too is critical for root elongation and um, uh, it's, it's important also for sugar formation as you would expect since calcium is also that important. Sulfur is the other issue that we're deficient in. Uh, critical for protein production. You know, you don't get too far on protein synthesis without sulfur. Um, the digestibility of lignin is, uh, is increased. Um, by sulfur, so if we're really trying to improve um, the the digestibility of the fiber, that NDFT component, then we really need to have adequate amounts of sulfur. That will help us with with that aspect of it. And these deficiencies are going to stunt um, plant growth again. So it just demonstrates how important these these minerals are. This balance is to having some really wonderful um, forages that make a lot of milk. And just as a side note, garlic gets its smell from sulfur and sulfur-containing compounds, so it's a very vital um, um, nutrient. Uh, 
So this is the base that we're working from in our project. This is a, an overview of, of the paddocks. We're working with roughly 50 acres of irrigated pasture. And since this was uh, you know, basically a, a case study, we wanted to determine whether or not we could tell or determine the economic return for trying to adjust uh, this, uh, the, these issues, or trying to balance our soils. And working with several folks, we came up with a recipe that we um, began to apply um, to half the paddocks. We essentially randomized these uh, fields to either a treated or a non-treated paddock. Each paddock was about five acres each. And what we applied um, was uh, a ton of gypsum that we split to a fall and spring application. We applied 400 tons of high-cal lime, um, some boron, manganese, some zinc, and, and then we applied compost, um, quite a bit, five ton of compost uh, to the amended paddocks. And the total cost was $289.50 uh, total, and that is applied. And it went into the amended paddocks and not to the um, non-amended paddocks. So the non-amended paddocks we just left to sit. Um, although the entire um, area was grazed, so we, we did have the cows moving through those paddocks and in, um, in managed intensive grazing. So we move uh, the fence, we move wire every 12 hours, so cows are on fresh feed every, every 12 hours. The sampling regime well, we began collecting um, composite samples on transects, so we would collect, um, you know, ten composites um, using a ring, and and then mix that composite um, and use that as our our sample. And we sampled uh, three times a year. We replicated this for three years over time, and we stayed with one laboratory, Dairy One Forage Lab, to make sure that we had some consistent data. The types of plants and forages that we were using. Um, our cool season grasses are ryegrass. I mean, that's our staple, as I'm sure it is for many of you. Some brome, prairie grass, clovers. We uh, we have been improving some with brassicas and, and some forb, but you know, basically that's our sward. And we can graze in March. Typically, we can start grazing some in March if we've got um, a, a great spring, maybe even in February, and we can graze all the way through October. Um, with the 50 acres and 5 acre blocks, we get these 12 hour rotations and it really depends upon the time of year as to how much rest we're able to give these paddocks. But you know, we strive for you know, 18 to 21 days in the spring and then as the summer heat kind of catches on, we're, we're talking more like 30, 35 days rest in the summertime because things tend to slow down a little bit as that summer heat comes on. And these are our cows. Uh, it's basically a New Zealand uh, base herd. I, I know many of you are probably curious about what kind of animals that we have on this system. Uh, we milk around 90 cows. Uh, it's a seasonal herd. We calve in January, February, and March. And uh, we, we try to get about 50% uh, DMI uh, into these cows um, over the course of the grazing season. They're, um, they average right around 40 to 45 pounds, and we have about a 12-month calving interval. These cows do really well on, um, on that system, and we don't push them very hard. Um, we're more interested in net profit than we are necessarily in maximizing um, milk production. If you look at the overall tonnage of forage that's being produced on these paddocks, we were using a capacitance probe, uh, which basically measures the dry matter, and we we calculated that we we ran the capacitance probe pre and post grazing. And um, essentially throughout the year, um, and averaged over the course of the three-year study, we were producing about 1,400 pounds more of dry matter per acre over the course of the entire um, season. And of course, you know, there's some seasonal fluctuations, as I've already indicated, um, in terms of overall forage production. And you can see what that does to our cost of production. You know, this is our cheapest feed. So the more green grass and uh, this lush grass we can get into these cows, it makes the bottom line a lot better because that's going to be the least uh, expensive feed as well, as, as the best feed. So 
Now, in getting into the forage analysis, so now we this is the data that's coming back from Dairy One, the forage lab, and essentially this particular diagram looks at the non-fiber carbohydrates. So this would not be the cell wall structure. This would be those pectins and the sugars that are found inside that cell, and the amended paddocks had a three and three point eight percent increase in um, these non-fiber carbohydrates. So these non-fiber carbs are going to be the non-cell wall carbs and the sugar, the starch, the pectin, and you know the um, other um, soluble acids. The uh, acid detergent fiber is uh, basically uh, used to calculate the energy that's derived from the forage. Um, it's the, the fibrous indigestible portion of the forage, including lignin, cellulose, silica, and the insoluble forms of, of protein. So it's, a, it's an indication of how much fiber is there in the diet. And as, a, as the um, acid detergent fiber increases, the overall digestibility of that grass um, and energy levels decrease. The digestible energy levels decrease. So you can see with the amended paddocks, we, were able, we had a, a much lower ADF. Um, so we're getting more um, digestible energy out of those forages. Neutral detergent fiber is a measure of cellulose and hemicellulose in lignin, and so it tends to be more correlated with intake. Um, the higher the neutral detergent fiber, the higher the total fiber um, in that forage. It, it's, uh, this particular number inc includes the hemicellulose. So um, it's an indication of just how much forage of this particular forage you can get in, into that cow. And as the neutral detergent fiber increases, your DMI will decrease. So as the fiber component of the grass increases, the amount that you can actually get in her physically decreases. There's just not enough room in the rumen. And that's what this diagram basically you know, demonstrates. This is the amount of forage intake. This is the NDF of that forage. And you can see intake declines as NDF increases. So we want highly di we want uh, forages that are going to be um, rather low in NDF. Net energy, that's the amount of energy that's actually available um, in that forage. Um, we specifically uh, focus in on NEL, which estimates the energy value of a feed um, that's available for milk production and body maintenance. Um, it takes roughly 0.74 megacals of NEL uh, to produce one kilogram of milk. Um, so that's a, a parameter that you would uh, try to shoot for in terms of um, uh, optimizing NEL. We want to try to get as much energy in these forages as possible. Uh, the other aspect that we looked at in, uh, in this study was uh, how well the fiber digested. And um, you know, if you recall, we, we talked a little bit about that early on. Um, this particular uh, diagram shows in vitro the, the true digestibility, um, which uh, IVTD is a lab test that, that simulates the digestion as it occurs in the rumen. It's, it's, a, it's a test for true digestibility of the forages. It's a true measure of the nutrient that's available within a feed, and it's used to calculate then NDFD, which is the neutral detergent fiber digestibility, which is a measure of how digestible that fiber is um, in the feed. And in both cases, you know, we had um, um, we, we had higher levels of, of fiber digestibility um, in the amended paddocks as, a pair, as compared to the uh, to the non-amended. And this is basically a diagram that's, that's showing how in the rumen, these microbes, the rumen microflora, are attacking these uh, cell wall structures of this forage in the, in, that, um, in the rumen and breaking it down, making those nutrients available not only for additional microbial growth, but also for the animal and for um, making those nutrients available um, for milk production. Uh, this is uh, a, an example of an alfalfa stem that's been, that has been um, conditioned or exposed to the IVTD um, process in the lab where it is being um, digested over a 48-hour period. And you can see how you know, we've got material and, and 
plant matter here and, and after the digestion is over this is the, the structure that we're left with and obviously this is the total indigestible component of, of that particular alfalfa stem. And certainly, you know, not all fiber is created equal. So it's it is important just how digestible the fiber component is because there's unrealized energy and nutrients there. So if, for example, you were to take two forages that were identical in terms of fiber content, and you know that, that the fiber would be reflected in the NDF and ADF, and then these two fibers could vary could differ very much in terms of how digestible that particular fiber is. So we want to make that fiber more highly digestible. And you can see then the impact that that has on dry matter intake. So forage A has an NDFD of 58%, which means we're breaking down more of this fiber and therefore able to eat a lot more because we're able to move this through the system. We're able to digest this, break it down, and move it through the system. However, forage B, it has an NDFD of only 36%, even though it has similar content. The makeup of that fiber is very different, and so it's more difficult uh, for the rumen microflora to break it down, and therefore we're only going to get 22.8 pounds of dry matter in that cow. And you know this is where the milk is being made. So the more dry matter intake, the higher the milk production. So we want to try and optimize that as much as possible. So then we start looking at these indexes. Um, this is the relative forage quality, RFQ. Um, it's a pretty comprehensive index of the overall value of the forage as a feed. The higher the RFQ, obviously, the better. And you can see that um, you know this is reflected in the amended. So by amending our paddocks, we increase the overall quality of that feed. Um, and then this parameter looks at the uh, pounds of milk um, that are produced per ton of dry matter. Um, so this would be the additional milk value of the forages. Um, it's, it's a projected milk production per ton of dry matter consumed based on the overall digestibility and the energy content of that forage. And as I've shown you, the amended forages had more energy. They had, um, you know, they had a better um, fiber, they had a lower fiber content, and that fiber was more digestible. And they had higher energy loads. So you can see that that's why we're, we're seeing a more milk being produced per ton of dry matter in the amended paddocks. So we tried to put some numbers to this so that we could really assess whether or not we were getting you know, value for that uh, $289 per acre that we were investing. And I know that sounds, there's a little sticker shock associated with that. It, and I mean, I had it as well. I, I have to live within a budget. And, and that, that, that was a sizable investment, um, considering the size of our budget. So when we looked at the numbers, then, then cows grazing the amended paddocks, um, based on our information, will produce an additional 331 pounds of milk over the course of the year uh, for every ton of dry matter that they're going to be consuming. So you know, here is some value that's being returned uh, to the program, to the dairy. So in our grazing system, in our particular situation, each cow consumes over two tons of dry matter from pasture-based forages over the course of the grazing season. So if we were to crunch those numbers, we would take the dry matter demand of that cow, which is basically 40 pounds, and if half of that is in the, these pastures, and that's what we strive for, is a 50% DMI off pasture. And our grazing season is over 200 days, then total pasture dry matter intake is about two tons of dry matter of, um, of pasture forage per cow per season. So if we use that, that number and realize that every cow is eating you know, two tons of dry matter from those paddocks, and she's producing 331.7 pounds more milk per ton of dry matter that she eats due to the improved forage quality, then she's producing an extra 663.4 pounds of milk per grazing season, if you walk through my calculations there. So two tons of dry matter, um, you know, for every one ton we get, get 331.7 pounds of additional milk, you know, so that is equal to 
um, 3.4 pounds of milk. So each cow will generate an additional 199 point or 199 dollars per grazing season at 30 dollar milk. So that's basically taking this milk volume and multiplying it by that milk price. So that's another um, you know, economic return. For our 90 cows, that's, that's just under $18,000 of additional income. And, and, and basically, you know, we invested 14. So we are seeing an economic return there on a per cow basis. Another way to look at this, of course, you've got the additional yield, which we really didn't calculate in that um, quality figure. So um, just trying to get a, a handle on what value that brings back to the farm. If these amended paddocks are producing additional feed, um, that's feed that I don't have to buy off farm and bring on to feed those cows if I'm that short on feed. Or I can store that feed as additional store feed you know, for a, a time of the year when I don't have really good forage available. Um, either way, um, I chose to, to calculate that based on the replacement of that feed cost. So um, feed of that same value is going to be about 17.6 um, cents per dry matter pound. That would be the cost of comparable quality type hay. So our amended paddocks would have returned $253 in additional feed at those replacement prices when you work through the numbers on the additional yield we're getting. So on a per acre basis, that's the additional yield. So the amended paddock saved about $6,300 in replacement feed costs each year on those 25 amended paddocks. So yeah, I realize everyone will, would calculate this you know, in their own way. Um, and there are a, a number of ways to look at it. Um, one other way that um, I, I I pushed a pencil was really on a per acre basis and since our paddocks were approximately five are producing about five tons of dry matter per grazing season you know and if we are getting 331 pounds more milk per ton that's quite a bit more milk per acre at 30 cents that's about $500 additional milk income per acre based on quality and yield so any way you look at it, it looks as though this thing is uh, amending these um, uh, soils, to, trying to balance that uh, profile in, in a way that is um, more in line with you know, the Albrecht um, um, base saturation ratios really does improve the overall forage quality, at least in, you know, in, in our situation. What we see is a net increase of about $461 per acre per grazing season for having amended our paddocks to, to meet those needs. What we didn't really calculate was the impact of, of improving the soil organic matter, which will happen over time, um, which comes along with balancing those soils and embellishing all aspects of the profile. The, uh, you know, clearly by balancing the chemical aspects, we're going to improve the biological aspects of the soil, and by doing that, we're going to improve um, the overall physical structure of the soil. All of that feeds forward to build soil organic matter. And the NRCS has given us a really interesting statistic. They say that for every 1% increase in soil organic matter, you're going to have an increase in water holding capacity of about a half an inch, which ultimately makes your farm a lot more drought tolerant or drought resistant because you're, you're building in that water holding capacity. The additional biology that comes along with these higher you know, soil organic matter soils also and these balanced soils will improve the overall soil structure. So you just have um, a better CEC, you have better nutrient availability, and you're more likely to hold on to those anions like sulfur and boron so that you don't have to do these applications year after year. You'll be able to hold those um, anions in your soil profile instead. And, you know, building that biology, you know, you, you create it, you build it, and they do come. Um, earthworms, I've, I've gained a real appreciation uh, for the earthworms. 2,000 earthworms will, will provide your farm 125 pounds of castings per year. That's worm manure that's really rich in, 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 in food for your soil biota. You'd be feeding a lot of microbes and, and plant plants um, with these earthworms. And it's been estimated that 25 worms per cubic foot is equivalent to having about a million worms per acre. And that's going to create 62,000 pounds of worm castings a year, which is a lot of worm manure. 
Um, healthy populations can move over 20 tons of soil. You know, we're talking about soil aeration here and opening up that soil profile so that we can get air and, and water down into that um, into the living components of your soil. They can eat quite a bit um, of organic matter. They burrow pretty deep. And the other thing that um, I learned in this process that I was trying to impress Deb and Alice with earlier before we got started was the fact that um, you know once we move um, you know phosphorus through an earthworm, it is actually seven times more available in in worm manure than it was um, before uh, the worm got a hold of it. So it, the worms are actually making these nutrients more available um, to the plant. And I uh, I'm a big fan of earthworms, and so when I saw this, I just had to include it in this talk. This is the Megascolites um, australis. This is a heck of an earthworm, and it comes from the Gripsland area of of Australia where they, they've got grazing lands there that have been in, in pasture for decades and you can see the results is that they do have some very rich soil biology uh, and that's a, a that's a worm that's a, a meal all in and of itself and when I say that you know you build it and they will come this is another interesting um, caveat that I'm, I'm going to throw out there um, we've had our paddocks when we inherited the dairy in 2007 and transitioned it into a grass-based organic dairy system you know it had been you know managed um, for decades and we were unable to um, get a lot of um, dung beetles um, in in that particular area and now that we're almost seven years into the uh, um, the the changeover in the organic system plan, we're seeing five different subspecies of dung beetles appear and, and that's really an important part of the integrated pest management program for any organic dairy. To, to maximize all of these um, organisms that work in a symbiotic kind of a relationship with your food producing system, it's just, uh, it's just uh, uh, it's it's uh, a very interesting uh, thing to watch evolve and and come to life. So these little guys will de um, work through a manure pad in no time. It'll only take a, a day or two, and they will have completely digested that manure pad and have um, balled up the manure and taken it down into the soil profile so that it can feed the root tips and soil microbes and all that biology and not allow the flies to to have at it and create more external parasite problems. So we're really pleased with that. So ultimately the take home message, um, what we've learned in our case study and tracking this information is that balanced soils do make better forages and, uh, and it, it makes more milk, it makes for some very happy cows and uh, more sustainable farms. Um, this is our dairy management team and I wanted to make sure I acknowledge them. Uh, this dairy doesn't you know, operate all by itself. Uh, Darby Holmes is our, our, um, our herd manager. She does a fantastic job and she um, also supervises a, a great group of, of individual students that make sure all of this stuff happens. Um, how they, they make sure the cows get milked and bred and fed and, and, and that the research that uh, I come up with, uh, we make sure that we get it all done. They've been wonderful to work with. I also want to acknowledge Organic Valley, the Farmers Advocating for Organics Fund uh, for the source of funds. They've been um, exceptionally supportive of this kind of work. Uh, also, the California Ag Research Initiative um, was also a funding source for this research. Um, my Organic Dairy Advisory Group, you guys know who you are. Um, they have provided me with a, a lot of input in terms of what kind of research we should be doing here. We follow that. Uh, to the letter, and I appreciate their input. Um, special thanks to Jerry Brunetti with Agrodynamics for his help in terms of uh, working through the soil profiles and uh, coming up with an amendment program that, that made sense and one that we could afford to do and uh, helped design the study and, uh, and overall has been a real mentor. Mark Kopecki from Organic Valley, their soil agronomist. Mark, thank you very much for all your time and attention. He's spent a lot of time reading this and and going through the data and uh, has been a, a great person to exchange ideas with and of course Deb um, thanks so much for helping uh, pull this all together and uh, I think I'm ready for questions okay the first question had to do with stocking density or your stocking rate um, the this person says at a hundred cows per acre at what looks like pretty heavy cows is 
a heavier stocking rate than I would normally think of as uh, management intensive grazing, wouldn't the heavier s density affect intake as cows are less, less selective? Was that intentional? Was it less selective? Was well, I think it's what's the, in, the heavy stocking rate. Was that intentional or was that sort of your norm? Yeah, I don't know that um, I was heavier than um, yeah, I guess everybody you know has their own interpretation of you know what's heavy. We you know we don't uh, when we leave a paddock, you know we're we're leaving there with you know fifteen hundred pounds or so of plant residue left behind and and if you don't have adequate amounts of pressure, then there is too much selection. And so there's a real delicate balance there and a lot of that is you know uh, farm by farm by farm depending upon the quality of the forages the density of the sward the cows cows grazeability and these are these cows weigh about a thousand pounds you know I don't know maybe they look a little bit bigger in those photos but these are these are Jersey cross cows that are basically New Zealand type genetics they have big barrels and they've been selected for grass and um, and that's what they get so I'm um, I, I guess uh, if I'm leaving behind that much residue, I mean, I, I, I need to leave that much residue behind in order to, you know, get the response rates. Otherwise, the the rest periods um, get get prolonged um, because we're we're pulling way too much um, you know, you know, material, plant material off off the ground. I'm not sure I necessarily answered your question, but you know, I, I guess it, it appears to be appropriate for our particular our program. Um, I'm, it's a delicate balance between leaving too much and you know leaving too little. Uh, you know, we don't we don't want weeds to prevail. I don't want selective grazing, and um, you know I want to leave enough residue so that I've got a response rate so that those those uh, paddocks will recover. Right, and I think someone typed in 50% uh, of dry matter came from pasture, so not too heavy as a comment. Um, okay, so our next question okay. is when the volume of m uh, milk produced went up. With the um, with your amendments, um, did the quality of milk go up as well? Do you see any difference? Yeah, we didn't measure any of that kind of thing. No, no, that was not something that we necessarily we didn't measure quality. Uh, we didn't measure components um, in this study. And uh, to go along with that, have you tested milk quality as uh, proteins or anything like that? It sounds like no. As part of this study. You know, we, we regularly, you know, we do components, but we didn't test the differences between treatment groups, no. Okay, this person says, can you please share the testing frequency and costs? And um, they say, well, this may be included in your research report, which it is. Um, so I will post the research, the link to the research report in the chat pod so everyone will have that resource again. Um, but do you want to have uh, t address the testing frequency? How many times do you test those? Um, did you sample? Well, we we sampled um, you know three times uh, through the year, um, and so that was our um, basically our composite uh, sampling regime. So we sampled three times. Um, I uh, believe you know March, April, June, and July and August. So it was spaced out throughout the uh, um, the season for the most part. Um, and and so then we just you know replicated that each time. And each sample that we collected was a, a composite of, of 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 three ring throws um, on our transect. And I think you can find it uh, listed in the paper as it's posted um, on the website. Great. And um, how quickly did you see the benefits of the amend amendment program? You know, it really took, it was, in, you know, visually, and that's something that I think really needs to come to light here. I mean, I hear a lot of producers say that, you know, when they put out their fertilizers, they see the result. And, and, I, and I get that if, you know, if you're, um, but this was not that. I mean, this was not something that you can pick up visually. This was something that, was, that we had to pick up only by doing the chemical analysis, by actually getting the forage analyzed, were we able to see these changes. So it wasn't as if we could see a change in the overall, you know, um, chlorophyll or the, the, you know, the, the green density of the, 
the forages. And you know, we also measured species composition and we didn't see a change in the overall forage composition. Now we do do a reseeding, but we reseeded at the same amount and same um, variety of, of, of seeds every, every fall. So when we come through and we reseed those 50 acres, we reseed them all with the same um, varieties and the same seeding rates. Um, but that is part of our program, and 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 that is uh, you know to try and, and optimize the amount of product, uh, production that we can get per acre, because I am limited on grass. You know, I'd like to have a lot more acreage. I would love to have a hundred acres so that I could um, you know be a hundred percent DMI. But I mean that's just not um, um, that's just not in the cards for us. We've only got 800 acres at the university farm. I've already got a hundred of it certified. So um, you know a portion of that is in a, a row crop on the other side of the farm. It's, there's no way that we can actually convert that into pasture um, based on the, the current system that we have in play. So it would be ideal if we had more pasture, um, but um, I don't. So we're, we're living within this particular paradigm. OK, great. Thanks. Um, how did amend the amendments change the legume composition of the pastures? Did you see a change there? No, we didn't see a legume change. Uh, you know, we we typically have a white clover uh, combination, and that's that's very consistent with what we had. We didn't try to reseed anything else there. So by and large, you know, we just had uh, yeah, that was fairly consistent. And and, and as I said to the composition, the species composition, I was really anticipating that we would see a species composition change, but it didn't happen. So um, pretty much the swords stayed um, constant between the amended and non-amended paddocks. OK, great. Um, are you aware of any work that has been done on improving the soil calcium in conventional dairy grazing systems and their costs and returns? You know, I haven't. Um, I've seen some calcium um, supplementation in corn, and you know, there there does appear to be you know a benefit in terms of, of corn yield with in calcium deficient soils. But I think this is a good place to say too that uh, the response that we had gotten w would is predicated on our soil type. The fact that you know we started out with a 55% base saturation for calcium and and the micronutrient deficiencies that we had. So you know these same results, you know, you know we can't we can't predict what what this would do on your farm. Um, so you would you know basically have to do some tracking um, in order to be able to capture that kind of data. But I guess what this shows is that um, there there is some significant improvements that can take place when you do approach and try to balance soils uh, for the for the mineral and the chemical profile. It does have a, a beneficial effect on forage quality. It certainly did on our farm. And can you just um, mention what types of soils you have? Someone was asking about your soil types. It, it's a Chico loam. We call it a Chico loam. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's um, yeah, it's it's really quite a, a beautiful uh, you know clay loam soil. Well drained sounds loam loamy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. It is a little tight though. I you know I'd have to say that we do aerate it. Um, we haven't. Um, and an airway system that we go through and we aerate with them, but I'm hoping that over time, you know, that we can improve um, the aggregation. We can improve that um, significantly with um, continued work to balance these soils, um, and um, and then hopefully we can uh, uh, not have to aerate quite so often. But it does make a difference, that high, high magnesium. Um, overall, I think if you take a look at the research paper, you'll see the changes that have taken place in the soils. And we are driving down that magnesium. And I think that's really key. So calcium is up. I think we're around a 62% base saturation in the amended paddocks. And uh, the magnesium is dropping. So I think we can, uh, we've been skewing that ratio. So it is happening in, in um, soils that have a 13 um, CEC. So it's, it's, it's happening. Um, it's obviously, you know, it's taken five decades to get here. So it's going to take some time to reverse this system. But the fact that we've been able to get this turned around in, in these four or five short years, I think is um, interesting and I think hopeful. Great. Um, what other feeds con uh, constituted the remaining 50% of the cattle diet? Um, that was uh, constant among all cows, and it was basically a combination of, of, uh, of a, a grass silage, a winter silage, a winter forage silage, and some alfalfa. And depending upon the uh, forage production, 
um, we we try to you know make up the the dry matter demand in that cow with with that supplement that we supply one time a day, so they are fed that one time a day where they also get fed their minerals. So we are force feeding mineral um, in in that particular ration. They do get some grain in the parlor. Um, at this point in time, they're just under six pounds. Okay, great. Um, okay, so in your opinion, what would be your primary focus if you had to choose one, amending soils or developing a fodder feeding system? <laughs> <laughs> oh, amending soils. I want, uh, I want green grass out there growing. I would, uh, yeah, I'm, I mean, we're not satisfied yet. Um, you know, I'd really like to see base saturations climb up there over 70, you know, and I want to see um, a better soil structure, um, more soil biology. Uh, the worms are coming. I mean, like I said, the so yeah, I think that uh, investing in the soils is a really um, good plan, and and we are dabbling in the uh, the fodder um, research. We do have a system. We are experimenting currently. Don't have any really um, don't have a lot of information at this point in time to, to share, um, but hopefully I will with time. Great. And the next couple of questions have to do with uh, pasture irrigation um, or your pasture irrigation system. Can you describe mm -hmm. the role that um, irrigation plays in your management system? Oh, well, that's huge. I mean, we wouldn't be able to, to exist. Um, not in this way um, on this particular you know property. The the irrigation does um, start uh, usually at the end of May, first of June. So we're operating off of uh, natural rainfall from November, December, um, January, all the way through the end of May. So we get six months of natural rainfall, and then from there on, we use artificial means of applying water. So that water then will be applied. Um, from uh, in June um, all the way through um, October and typically we'll turn it off then um, if, if we get some fall rains it's kind of nice we can turn the water off earlier. Um, we get um, really good uh, cool season grass growth early in the spring. Um, our warm season grasses tend to kick in in July, August and September and then we get a little bit of resurgence of our ryegrass uh, that kind of comes back um, October. Um, as things kind of cool down again, it's cool enough for our ryegrass to come back on. So yeah, there's a lot of seasonality to the grass, which means, and frankly, um, as that summer heat kicks in, the digestibility of the fiber also changes, um, as you would expect, because that plant is really responding to that heat. And so what was really um, highly digestible fiber in the early spring tends to be a lot less digestible um, in the summer and so that does change um, their ability to, to, to take in that forage and so that has to be compensated um, with that supplemental feed that we feed. Okay and are you um, using flood irrigation? Yes, we're using flood irrigation. Half the paddocks are flood and the other half are sprinkled. Okay. Roughly. Uh, okay. So, given that, um, with reasonable distribution and uniformity, can you amend your soils using your irrigation as the delivery system? Mm. Oh yeah, I can. Yeah, that would be uh, you know a nice way to do that if you're set up with um, you know those dosatrons and uh, a system where you could feed it in at a rate that you know you felt were reliable and that all of your amendments were soluble. Um, see that, um, you know, you could do that. We used uh, a granubore, but there is, uh, you know, boron's available as solubore as well. There is a soluble calcium that could be applied, and that might, uh, you know, that is not a, a bad option. The thing that I worried about with the gypsum is that, you know, the gypsum, you know, is, uh, is you know, that, that powder, it either comes really, really powder or there's some flakes or chunks, but, you know, and then those um, end up, getting worked into the soil over time, um, that solubilized calcium would probably be a really good option. So, uh, you know, that's, I think that's a really
really good idea uh, to kind of use that to, to work in your soil amendments over time. Um, but you also have to keep in mind the leachability of some of these components. And so if you're overwatering, you're going to take that sulfur right with you and boron. So you have to really watch your anions if you're going to be doing that kind of a thing. If you're in a very heavy soil or if you're in a high CEC type soil, you may not have that problem. Um, but it's just something to be cognizant of. And you can test that really by catching your tailwater and figuring out just what's coming through. Um, so you might be able to track that because you'd hate to invest in all of that and then have it just wash off in your in your tailwater. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, can you just uh, remind us were the amendments applied before the acres were certified organic? No, we were certified organic before we applied. Okay. Um, any um, testing of microbial organisms uh, biomass in the amended versus the non-amended? I, you know, that had always crossed my mind. I think that's a really good idea, but we had not done that. Um, you know, Betsy Boyd is our entomologist, and she's the one that had done the species identification on the dung beetle populations, and she's the one that said, well, you've got five different species here. And so we were pretty jazzed about that, but, you know, she had her entire entomology class out there doing some speciation work, and they weren't able to really pick up differences in um, you know, insect populations on the amended versus non-amended forages. Um, within the soils, you know, we really haven't investigated that, but I think that's a really good, well, I think that's a very interesting idea. Um, no, and we haven't investigated that yet, and yeah, I think it would be certainly worthwhile. Okay, this is a, a little bit different of a question. So um, this person says that some growers um, that they're working with have argued that leaving cows um, for 12 hours in the field is too much for the cows and they say they'd rather keep them inside. What is your take on this comment? Uh, it's too hard on the cows to leave them out on the pasture for 12 hours? That's, is that the question? Yeah, that's what it seems to be. Okay. I think that it's too Which? hard for those cows. Well, I tell you, I'm not sure I can keep my cows in. So if I gave them the choice, and um, you know, I do, uh, I can open up that gate. And if I gave them the choice, they'd be out in that paddock in that grass. So, and if it's raining, mm, they would probably choose to be inside and under cover. Um, so interestingly enough, you know, in December and January, where we get our our really bad storms, we have um, a sacrifice pasture that we go to and uh, they're out in the pasture um, when it's not raining, when it is raining, they're in, in undercover. So mm, uh, that's a tough question. I'm not sure I necessarily answered it and I can probably just, you know, based on my experiences here, I think cows like to be out on, on grass. Okay. Um, have you heard of any similar studies um, that have been conducted for beef uh, production? Oh, well, this definitely has, you know, inference into the beef cattle um, scenario because we're always trying to, you know, increase the overall quality of forages in beef cattle to finish beef cattle off on grass. And the only way you're going to do that is by increasing the sugar and the carbohydrate content of the forages going in. So if you are into a 100% grass fed, you're going to try and finish beef cattle. You're going to have to increase the overall um, quality of the forages going into those um, animals um, as you get into that later. Um, portion of their growth curve. You know, that's that's where you actually, you know, that's that that's where it's even more critical. So you there there is lots of application here. I can uh, I would definitely say that this would Im improve those paddocks as well. But it's site by site, you know, and you won't know until you test. And then once you do test, um, then you need to get together with somebody that really can understand these these soil parameters. I mean, we've given you some basic ideas on on what to be looking for, you know, in terms of pH and base saturations and and C E C. I mean, those are the fundamental. That's their basic language. Um, so you're you're talking fundamental soil science there, but um, I think ultimately when you're designing a remediation program and, you know, the economics and trying to identify compounds that you can use in your particular system, whether you're organic or not, um, you, you really need to get a hold of somebody, a professional a coach. I call them a soil coach and, and have them kind of walk you through the process. 
uh, especially initially. And there's lots of great resources out there. And I think um, you know one of those is building soils for better crops, sustainable soil management. Um, Fred Magdoff and uh, Harold Van Ness. They that's a really good book that um, I uh, I enjoy. So um, yeah, it definitely has application to beef cattle. Long and answer. That's no, nope, that's fine. Um, I'll try to put in the the link to uh, Fred and and Harold's book um, in the in the chat. That'd be great. In just a second. Um, okay, I just someone had um, typed in a comment um, that says the first herd of over 20k milk production in one of the southern states was 100% grass. That was in 1977. Mm. So excellent. So what does that tell you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. And yeah, thank you for that. Um, so I think I might have missed um, one of these questions. If I have missed your question, could you just type it back in? I think though I've gone through. Oh, the book title. Yes, let me just uh, try to find Fred and Harold's book very quickly. Someone was asking about better soils. Here we go. Building soils for better crops. Soil sustainable soil management. And it's a uh, SARE uh, book, so if you it go to yep, SARE.org, S-A-R-E dot O-R-G. And I just popped it into the uh, chat pod, so hopefully you'll see that popping up. Good. Okay, okay, so yeah, there was a question about um, a, a farm that has mixed a mixed species. So they have, uh, I'm just going to read this straight out. So we use rotational grazing on our farm of 17 acres for a mixed herd of milking goats, sheep, and steers. Our forage is very diverse, including bird's foot trefoil, which I'm very happy about. But on the list of poisonous plants for Washington state, bird's foot is listed as poisonous for cattle and sheep. Do you have any experience with this forage and its quality? Bird's foot trefoil is a great legume. It's been yeah. a nitrogen fixer. It's a good one, and um, and we really try to get as much of that uh, going as possible. It's a really good forage. High I, in tannins uh, too, right? For your sheep, it definitely is high mm -hmm. in tannins, and you know there's, you know, some beneficial. Um, um, you know, um, alternative health kinds of implications there in terms of that that tannin content, but um, in terms of toxicity, I, I guess I'm I'm yeah I have not experienced that. Um, we try to embellish um, birds foot tree fall wherever we can. Um, I will say though that you know we we haven't been able to get it well established in our location. And I don't know if it's because of the heat or if it's because of the soil profile, but you know, so far I've been unsuccessful in in uh, in bird's foot trefoil. We can grow clover, uh, white clover, Ladino clover, like crazy, um, but um, not bird's foot trefoil for um, whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And just um, a side note, there is a project being conducted on an organic dairy um, project. Um, out of Utah State um, University that's um, con being conducted specifically on uh, bird's foot trefoil. So I'm happy to get you those um, contacts if, you're, if you would like. Hopefully we'll have a, a webinar on that project fairly soon. Um, Cindy, do you have any comments about increased uh, CLA in milk from pasture-based production? Mm. Well, hopefully that'll be the next webinar that I do. We've uh, we've completed a, a USDA grant looking at the impact of grazing or pasture dry matter intake on these these lipids on the lipid profile of milk, and there is a direct correlation uh, between pasture DMI and conjugated linoleic acid or CLA, that real potent um, antioxidant. And of course, um, omega-3, but you know it's also influenced by grain intake. Um, so that's going to kind of throw a wrinkle into it, as is um, CLA. So um, grass is really you know the key with that lipid, um, as it is with um, alpha tocopherol. It is with um, beta carotene and a variety of other um, compounds and components, um, CoQ10, quercetin, lutein. Um, retinol. I mean, so there's a whole host of compounds that are really, really good for you um, that come through into the milk, through the grass, um, which you know really is um, quite beneficial. Not only you know for us 
in the milk as we drink that milk, but it's also great for the cow because they're seeing that as as the blood concentrations of you know vitamin E go up in a cow, incidence of retained placenta go down. And the same thing is true for vitamin A. The incidence of you know different types of uh, of illnesses you know are decreased. And so, um, putting that grass through that cow puts those antioxidants into her system and, and then they come into the milk and so it's very beneficial from a herd health perspective as it is from a milk nutrient content perspective. It's nice if we could actually um, get the value from that in that you know a consumer, an educated consumer that would be willing to pay more money for that type of, of quality milk that's high in those potent antioxidants because um, you took the time to put some very um, high quality forages um, through that cow so that uh, yeah she could benefit. That's really good stuff and mm -hmm. hopefully we'll have that data turned around um, shortly. Right and, and again as a side note we did um, conduct a bovine milk fats webinar um, late last year and hopefully we'll be doing there's been some projects happening here in uh, North, the northeast, um, looking at bovine milk fats in pasture. So hopefully, you know, maybe next year <laughs> we'll have some data and some uh, nice research results to share with with folks. Um, so someone wrote in about um, bird's foot trefoil. So I just wanted to follow up quickly on that. So um, they say that um, BFT notoriously slow to establish, but extremely long lived and considered invasive in some places. Hmm. Just take note of that, and then Cindy, do you have a uh, have refer a reference on milk quality content with forage quality we could read? Not, uh, maybe the relationship between milk quality and forage quality. I mean, your study clearly. Anything? Uh, the one on the antioxidants on uh, on milk lipids is that is that what the one that they're referring to? Perhaps I'm not quite. Yes, she says yes. Yes, yes. Okay, yeah. Well, um, <laughs> just as soon as we can get it turned around. <laughs> uh, this is an exciting time in organic dairy research. There's lots of lots of things going on right now. Uh, and, yeah, and not enough time yes. in the day, right? Not enough time in the day. That is that's the struggle. That is the struggle. But yeah, some really interesting stuff. And uh, yeah, good stuff. Yeah. Any other questions that folks have? We're we're getting to the end of our time here. Almost. Probably could take one more question. If anyone has one. We've had some really good questions. I know. This has been fabulous. All right. I'm just looking at the question pod here. I'm not seeing any more questions. Okay. All right. Well, I'd like to really, I'd like to thank you all for your questions. They were really top notch and in, in your responses to Cindy. Um, as I mentioned before, you can find an archive of today's session, um, recordings of our other webinars, as well as articles, videos, and more at eextension.org slash organic underscore production. Cindy, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, and thank you for having me, Deb. Mm -hmm. And thank you all for coming. Have a good, have a good day.